Welcome to Washington State Legends of Soccer and our series, Why History Matters. I'm Frank McDonald. Today, our guest is Colleen Hacker. Colleen, as Pacific Lutheran head coach, has been at the center of women's collegiate national, collegiate soccer's national emergence, as well as the surge of the US women's national team into national and international prominence as an assistant coach. In 2019, she was inducted into the United Soccer Coaches Hall of Fame. She is a professor of kinesiology at PLU. Welcome, Colleen. Thank you, Frank. It's wonderful to be here. All right. It's good to see you. Um, so I want to first talk about your, your history. And you arrived here in Washington uh, after great success uh, in field hockey and basketball at Lock Haven. And then you became a quick study in soccer, starting the varsity program at PLU. So um, I know your gifts as a mental skills and performance psychology <laughs> coach were sought by U.S. soccer and, and hockey. Uh, that's several sports. So uh, what's universal to competing for championships uh, for coaches and athletes to maximize their resources? Yeah, and, and it's rare, Frank, for people to start out with, it, in my view, the central question, because we start out with records and achievements and accomplishments, and it's like, yeah, that's like 5th, 12th, 20th on the list. Here's as succinct an answer as I can give, and, and I'll, use, I'll use my own language and titles. I coached intercollegiately both at University of Arizona, Division I, and PLU, as you mentioned. And I said for the entirety of those 17 years that I coach soccer players, not that I'm a soccer coach. Mm -hmm. And so my response to you is people first, the sport second. And, uh, and that means that no two seasons are the same, no two athletes are the same, no two championships are the same, no two challenges are the same. For me, it's not programs, it's people. Yeah. You show me a good leader, you show me that some, you show me somebody that's invested in the people they serve, yeah. and I'll show you a successful program. Okay. All right. Good. I'll, I'll, uh, so when you're working with teams, and you talked about the byproducts, the records and the wins and so on. How, how do they set goals? How do you work with them to set goals? Yeah, I mean, that's like, you know, here's this broad topic and then all of a sudden taking one little pinhole yeah. about goal setting. If, if there's one thing that most coaches are doing right now, it's goal setting. I would respectfully say very few are doing it correctly. Honestly, although it's simple, it's not easy. I honestly, in short time, don't want to do like, you know, make it seem like this is some quick or simple thing. There's there's a body of literature. My work is evidence based, scientifically grounded. It's uh -huh. not based on, well, my experience or my opinion or this is what I've done. I think yeah. we really need to move away from that. I don't care how successful the person is. And I would just simply say that in the area of mental skills training and performance enhancement, goal setting would be one of about 12 to 15 mental skills that need to be integrated and appropriately implemented in a quality program. And for some coaches, they have that skill and expertise. Mm -hmm. For some coaches, they would be wise to seek out experts. That would be my response to that. Be, be careful. A little bit of knowledge is dangerous. And unfortunately, I'm seeing that too much in, in our sport. Okay, fair enough. Uh, when you began coaching at PLU, and there was relatively little women's collegiate history, or even na or certainly not a national team at that point right. to draw upon, so uh, Michelle Akers wasn't a household name, even in these parts, probably. Um, and there hadn't been a Division I program in the, in the state at that point. Uh, how did or did you measure your first few teams? 
Yeah, great question. I, you know, I do, I do want to do, since it's history, I'm hoping that this, this quick sort of anecdotal reality of my life serves as, um, I don't know, inspiration or, or a threat of possibility for other people. Mm -hmm. I never played intercollegiate soccer. The yeah. university that I went to that you mentioned, Lock Haven University, didn't field its first intercollegiate team till 1994. Mm. I'd already coached five teams in the national championship final by then. We had mm. already won 11 conference championships till my undergraduate school got it. So I want coaches to hear, I didn't play soccer. And I'm just struck by how many people's bio is 90% of, and he was an all American at and played for the this. And it's like, <laughs> I don't know about you, but my coach isn't going to be going on the field. Like we keep talking about people's legacy and their playing careers. And I'm like, don't really care. I don't care. <laughs> the connection of whether you're going to be a good coach because you used to be a has been. And I don't say that I don't say that disrespectfully. I joke, it's better that to be a has-been than a never was. So right. I wear my has-been-ness proudly, but we don't care about your playing career. At least I don't. Yeah. And I, I want people to hear that I had no intercollegiate background in soccer. I was hired at PLU to coach field hockey. I'm proud to say my first year, 1979, was the first winning season in field hockey here in 13 years yeah. my second season we qualified for the national tournament in only my second year and then plu dropped the sport so congratulations you qualify you've done something nobody's ever done before and that there goes your program so yeah. that became my impetus i wanted something for girls and women i wanted an intercollegiate experience because i knew how important it was and I put my head up as a neophyte in the soccer world and said, you know what, it's soccer. And so I'm proud that I started the program at PLU. And what I've come to find out as I've shared with you, uh, uh, Dr. Sean Latta, who looked at the history of women's soccer in the United States, we were one of the first intercollegiate programs. So I'm really proud about that. And it was from a place of, of love and passion for what sport can do, intercollegiate sport can do, good good, good coaching. I'm just going to say it. I, I just feel like good coaches, honestly, Frank, and, and smarter people than me can disagree, but good coaches, I think, could coach any sport. That's my opinion. The X's and O's in basketball, a trained monkey can be taught that. The X's and O's in lacrosse, I mean... It's a dime a dozen. Yeah. Nobody, nobody doesn't know what a flat back four is. Nobody doesn't know what a diamond midfield shape is. Nobody doesn't know what a two front is. You get my point. Yes. And yet we talk about this stuff ad nauseum as though this were the holy grail of accomplishment. Mm -hmm. People first. Let me just make a let me make a connection because I'm proud of this. And, and it's a history history podcast and we don't get to chat about this very much but i'm going to make two quick points because yeah. i don't think people understand that okay. yes there weren't division one programs the good news is we had access to the best players in the united states as a result of that not good players for little old private liberal arts universities yeah. not good players for the pacific northwest one of one of the first players on on one of our first national championship teams 1988 mm -hmm. is sonia brandt sonia brandt held the oregon high school scoring record mm -hmm. forever to be broken by tiffany milbrit to yeah. which i say any questions <laughs> i had the privilege and honor of coaching some of the best soccer players yeah. some of the best human beings in the united states not just in our little little corner of it yeah. we we were it, it's just remarkable only because it just came up at the LA, lafc 
uh, game when, when LAFC won the shield on the men's side in MLS, I'm proud to say that a Clive Charles coached University of Portland team has mm-hmm. never beaten a Colleen Hacker Pacific Lutheran University intercollegiate team. I'm and you proud did play. about that. So we played Santa Clara. We played University of Portland. We tied, or I'd like to say they came back and tied us. My final time going head to head with Clive, Millie was on the Portland team and Shannon McMillan was on the Portland team. That's who we were playing against. Yeah. I sought out the best, the best matchups that we could possibly get. I think those are little known facts it, with all due respect in our state. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't good for little. It wasn't good for early. It was good. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get back to that in a sec, but uh, when we, we visited over the years and, uh, but this past summer we, we saw each other um, and uh, you leaned in Uh, we were in a suite and you leaned in and said, this matters, you know, what we're doing matters. I I think you're talking about legends and uh, that meant a lot to me. Um, Tell me why, why it matters. Oh, Frank, I love that you heard. I love that you took it in. I love that you listened because it was heartfelt. Legacy matters. History matters. You have to know who paddled the canoe before you got in. And I think we live in a culture where all of us somehow think that that we've done this. Mm -hmm. Well, none of us have done this. None of us have done this. We all stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. And if we don't know their names, and we don't know the difficulties and the trials and the passion and the challenges that we face, we lose a major part of our legacy. Uh, You know, you need to know who came before. And you've heard me say earlier in this interview, people over programs. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm grateful that Washington State Legends of Soccer lifts up the PLU programs. I'm grateful for that. I think we're deserving of that. But it's people more than programs. Somebody had to have a passion. Somebody had to have a vision. And however difficult it is now, multiply that by 10 before people cared or knew or respected or understood. History, Frank, as you well know, is a living, breathing, ever-present gift. And if we don't know it, use it, embrace it, acknowledge it, and appreciate it, we lose some of ourselves in that process. So I will say to you now, Mm -hmm. thank you for what you are doing. It is essential It did not exist before you and before the people doing it. And you have enriched us all. I am grateful beyond measure. What is that, that, that occasion that we saw each other was uh, celebrating title nine. Tell me how often, especially this year uh, in, in the anniversary year, the 50th anniversary year, how often um, you're telling someone and you see their eyes widen. I mean, that they they really didn't understand the before, the after, or the during of the implementation. I think your job is to hurt my heart today, Frank. <laughs> but the answer to that, I just did a major event uh, for over two, 300 girls in, in uh, Seneca Falls in, in New York in conjunction with the National Women's Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Right. So Michelle Obama is inducted. Mia Hamm is inducted. This isn't sport. This is on, you know, in the United States. And I would tell you that 95 percent of the players and coaches have no clue what Title IX is. And if the coaches don't know, I can promise you the student athletes who play for them don't know. Now, let me quickly add. 
you know, as, as I said, I was chatting with Mia this morning. Mia would say to you, I, I disagree. Mia would say to you, that's good news. That's good news that nobody knows because they're so used to having it and living it and benefiting from it that it's good. It means that we've done our work. Okay. I understand that. I disagree with that for all of the reasons I've talked about before. I'm not exactly Grandma Moses here. And I'm here to tell you that my life is a pre-Title IX and a post-Title IX student athlete in high school and in college. No intercollegiate scholarships. You didn't have to offer women's sports. It's been a 900% increase in participation. 900%. So we all need to know Title IX. And I just did a webinar, I believe you saw it, for the United Soccer Coaches on the history of Title IX, where my role was to educate current coaches of women's sports, women's soccer. So it's male coaches of women's soccer and female coaches of women's soccer. Who is responsible for the passage of Title IX? What was their role? What was their legacy? So this thread of historical connection is a responsibility and an honor that I will continue to advocate for for the entirety of my career. We all should know about Title IX. And I'm glad that you don't have to, but you should. Yeah. You should. And, and I don't think we need to look further than, I'll just say it this way, diplomatically, the last year of United States history to say that once what was once guaranteed and taken for granted can be gone in the snap of a fingers. Add that, these battles are never over. These yeah. battles are never over. The need to advocate for, educate, fight for, needs to be generation after generation, waves of generation, in my opinion. No, I, I thank you for that. I, I didn't, I'm not gonna aim for your heart on this one. I'm gonna aim for your uh, creative streak. So this is our parting question, but if there is one moment in history that you witnessed or participated in uh, that left a very indelible mark on your heart, and that you wished you could share with everyone that you encounter or coach, what would what would that moment be or moments? You know, I don't even have to think, Frank, and it would surprise most people. I can't use names to respect those people. It's moments in the locker room before going out onto the field, knowing history is on the line. There are these precious touchstones of humanity, of my heart to their heart. We each knew what was about to happen. And, and there, oh, it just gives me goosebumps. I have many, many moments in that locker room that are so precious and so personal and so meaningful, infinitely more than a gold medal or a world championship. And people who know me know that's not hyperbole. I'm telling you the truth. Uh, it's those it's those moments that that will be with me for a lifetime. Thank you, thank thank you. All right, Colleen, thanks for sharing all of this. Like it's it's coming through the screen, and I just uh, thank you for everything you've done for our soccer community, not only here in the Northwest but at large. Um, I want to thank our producer today, Leanne Johnson, and thanks to all of you for watching Why History Matters. For more on the history of Washington State soccer and to learn more about Washington State legends of soccer, go to wasoccerlegends.org. We appreciate your support, your support, and we'll see you next time.